Folks, welcome to Trash Movie Bonanza, where two buddies are going to talk about some schlocky movies from the early 80s, The Hand, Pieces. Hopefully you haven't heard of them before, but if you have, let's get ready to have some fun together. Editor Jamie, give us that intro. Trash Movie Bonanza with your hosts, Jim and Chris. Folks, welcome to this show. I know the world needed another podcast breaking down bad movies. Uh, Jim, I think we should tell folks who we are just in case they don't know. Uh, you want to go first? Tell them a little bit about yourself. Yes, my name is Jim Mafood, professional comic book artist, freelance illustrator, movie fanatic, and uh, pleased yeah. to be here with you, Chris. We're going to have fun. Absolutely. Uh, and I host some shows about comic books. We don't really need to get into that, but it did bring Jim and I together, and we found out that we have a mutual admiration for not necessarily bad movies, but I would say schlock in other words sort of exploitative trashy type movies is that fair yes okay definitely fair good and we just want this to be a show where it feels like uh you're one of our friends too and you're just hanging out talking about movies we have two choices as in i chose a movie for jim to watch jim chose a movie for me to watch we'll get to mine later i chose a spanish american co-production total garbage called pieces We'll get to that. Let's start with your classier movie. <laughs> Jim, what are we going to watch? What did you make me watch? I chose The Hand, which is a 1981 Orion Pictures production written and directed by a fresh-faced, enthusiastic Oliver Stone straight off the success of his Midnight Express movie. Yep. Oliver thought he was making a classy psychological thriller with this movie. The movie studio thought he was making <laughs> a monster movie. So we have this incredible, strange, surreal sort of situation happening here where Michael Caine plays professional comic book artist uh, who loses his drawing hand in a horrific accident. The dismembered hand comes back to life and starts brutally murdering people. And, and I guess the question is sort of like for most of the movie, or is it all in his mind? Except it's always pretty clear that the hand is literally <laughs> killing people. Yes, that, that's what, so that's what I love about the vibe of this movie. It's kind of like an old school EC comics yeah. situation where it's like you as the viewer, you can interpret this as he snapped and lost his mind and is imagining all this and actually killing these people. Or this is a schlocky monster movie where a dismembered hand is doing the murdering for him. Um, Chris, the brilliant thing about this movie, and this is what I love about storytelling in the first five seconds of the movie, yeah, we, we are told exactly who this guy is. We see a shot of his beautiful home, his beautiful outdoor studio. He has a daughter running through the backyard. He's a family man. He's working at his drafting table. He's drawing. He's super talented. We see Super his talented. name. And we'll get to that. We'll, we'll, we see his name on the comic strip, Jonathan Lansdell. Yep. Uh, Mandro is the name of his... Uh, Mandro. The name of his macho, um, barbarian-esque, Conan-esque Sort of Conan, sort of Prince Valiant, right? Like yes. a little bit of both? Yeah. And what's great, man, is his drawing hand, he has a big old ring on his finger, a signet with, ring, a signet ring with JL, his initials. So almost like the ego, he himself is a comic book character, a superhero with like a yeah. magic ring. Yeah. So that's what I love is like in the beginning 
right off the bat, we know who this guy is and what's happening. And we're in, also introduced to the fact that he's married to a woman, Annie. his wife, Anne, who there's tension in their relationship. Yeah. I was kind of surprised. I just want to say that like, right from the beginning, we, we see the marital tension and John has a temper. So if this wasn't Michael Caine, this movie would just be so much worse for it because this character starts as an angry jerk and never really goes on a character arc. <laughs> That's the biggest thing that sort of makes this almost like schlock is that like the character starts at like a 10 and maybe goes up to an 11, but he's yes, never yes. like, he's, but he's our protagonist <laughs> and he's not likable at all, to be honest. The only thing likable is, is that it's Michael Caine and we kind of like Michael Caine. Yes, that is completely true. You're totally right. And um, he's a jerk. the saving grace of this movie is that Michael Caine is acting his ass off in this movie. Yeah. And I guess, man, so I guess there was kind of stories about Michael Caine in Hollywood during this era where I watched a really funny documentary about Jaws 4, which he's in, which is also just total trash. I saw that so early in life too. Like I saw all the Jaws movies early and yeah, yeah. I heard that he he decided to skip the Oscars, right? Just to get the paycheck for, for Jaws 4. I, I think it was something like that. But, but the... The gist of it was, if you could pay this guy his rate, yeah. he would show up and do your movie or your TV show, whatever it was. Yeah. He wanted the paycheck. In the situation of the hand, I feel like he earned it. Yeah. Like, the movie would That's not fair. be what it is without him. But yeah, man, I feel like he has, he embodies the freelancer's frustration as an artist. That's interesting. You know? I mean, you would know that best. Uh, you know, the, the scenes of him as an artist are relatively fleeting, but they did strike me as fair. It wasn't like completely out of left field how they treated doing a comic strip. Um, yeah, because there is some business stuff that goes on. It's not 100% clear whether he owns the character or is just the co-creator and a syndicate open, uh, owns it. I, I guess a syndicate owns it, but we'll get to that later. Yeah. So, you know, there's this situation with him and his wife where his wife is talking about taking off for part of the year to move away with the daughter because the wife is interested in this like new age. Definitely a new age cult. To me, man, it's like, the wife wants to join this new age, like cult basically. And Michael Caine is this old school kind of guy who's like, I don't want to have anything to do with this mumbo jumbo. I'm going to go over, I'm going to stay and work on my book, work on the comic. And I mean, who wouldn't want to, he's got a mansion in Vermont. He's got yes. like, they've got a daughter that they both seem to love, but I, I, I th yeah, that new age cult is, <sighs> Maybe we'll wait and get to that too, because we, we haven't quite gotten to New York, they, 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 right. but she wants to go there. And I'm kind of like, you've got a good life in Vermont. The thing, you know, that struck me now that I think of it is this Michael Caine's character. We keep calling him Michael Caine, even though the character is John, but it's easier to think of him as Michael Caine because he's yes. totally Michael Caine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he's so possessive. You know what I mean? He's possessive of his yep. strip and like how it should be portrayed. You know, there's scenes where he's like, that's not Mandro. Mandro wouldn't do that. That's not Mandro. Mandro knows what he wants. Mandro doesn't think. You drew all those little fucking bubbles with him thinking. And he's very possessive of his wife. So I think we understand from the beginning why she might not be happy. Yes. And, you know, this escalates in this brilliant scene of them in a car where tension is escal escalating between them. Michael Caine realizes that she wants to get away from him. Yeah. And the tension is building, man. And this is where Oliver Stone comes in as a, as a filmmaker, even though he's young. Right. I almost consider this scene to be like a masterclass in tension and editing and drama because there's this- It's escalated. They're fighting in the car. There's a crazy woman behind them honking. And Michael Caine's like waving her back, like get back. The wife makes a huge mistake and goes into the opposing lane. Michael Caine's right. hand is out the window and a passing truck 
takes his drawing hand completely off of his body, off of his arm. Look out! Get back! Get back! It's a very bloody scene. It's very bloody. It's like a holy shit moment. And that, and it's also like a very Roger Corman esque, yeah. pure schlock B movie moment where the car pulls over. Michael Caine jumps out of the car and there's like blood and screaming and hysteria. And that's when you know you, it's like, okay, this is, this is a, another movie now. Like, wh- where is this? It going? starts as though it's going to be a drama. You very quickly see, like, no, this, the, you know, get out of your head the Oliver Stone movies you've seen with like JFK and wall street and stuff, get that out of your head because this is early Oliver Stone and he's just basically trying to get his name out there. And, and it, yeah. and it is schlocky horror. I've used that yeah. word a bunch, but that, that is what it is in that moment. Um, and, and, and I think you're right that the scene is, it's already tense between two actors but it, it is ratcheted up with the annoying person behind honking and sort of interrupting this serious conversation they need to have. It gets him even angrier if yes. that's possible. Uh, and, and, and it, and it culminates in that awesome bit of like quick gore. It, 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 it yeah. finally like there's release when it, when it, like that gore just splatters everywhere. Yes. Uh, which I think we can both agree is it would be horrible enough to lose a limb. But when that limb is specifically how you make your living, oh, it's man. It, like, that's a scary thought to me. Like yeah. I love drawing and, and I, like if I lost my right hand, I would be devastated. Yeah. This is an artist's worst nightmare. And in the aftermath of the accident in the hospital, Michael Caine, his character, John is playing it cool and calm, but serious. And when his wife walks in the room, the look, of hatred that he gives her. I mean, you can see withering. His, you can see through his eyes into his brain that he is on fire inside and he will never forgive her. I mean, she's ruined his life. She's taken away his craft and his livelihood. Right. And like an old school man, he, instead of expressing this, he's repressing all of it. It's all and, simmering under the tension. That's yeah. only somebody like Michael Caine, right? Like any of the actors in the second movie that we're watching, they could not get that subtext. They just couldn't. Yeah. And but also, I would just say that like it, as horrible as it is, that sort of guilts Anne into staying in this relationship because she doesn't want to like, hey, I just took off your head, hand and I'm going to leave you now. Right. <laughs> she, she, right. she can't quite do that. She sticks around for a bit and then strange things start to happen and Michael Caine starts having these amazing visions visions that turn into black and white universal monster type footage. And he's in his studio at night and his black cat comes into the studio. I didn't understand this scene, just real quick. Like, please explain it because uh, it's weird. Yeah, so... Well, I was going to ask you the same thing, but so oh. the, the cat, because, now, Chris, you're a cat owner. I am. So, so the cat somehow suddenly has superpowers and jumps through the glass window of his studio. Yeah, it's and like it, it gets either angry the, or scared, and it yeah. jumps through a glass window. It and scares I was like, the shit out of Michael Caine. He jumps up from his drawing table, and he looks, and there's a little something or other in his studio that falls over in the corner. And it's actually revealed later that it's the hand crawling around in there. And the hand didn't like pick the cat up and throw it or anything like no. that. It scared the cat so much that it broke through a, a pane of, of glass. No. But I'm assuming, Chris, when you're at home with your wife and there's yeah, maybe a moment of tension at night, none of your cats have exploded through the window of Not your- Not through the window yet. And okay. and I have some very energetic okay. Bengal kittens. <laughs> yeah. uh, they get zoomies. They run around the house. I've never seen one try to jump through the window. Yeah, this is, th- th- this is what pushes it a little bit 
away from being a serious drama and closer to something like uh, one of the Friday the 13th movies, I want to say part four, Jason scares a dog so much it jumps out of like a yes. third story window. And yeah. I'm like, well, that doesn't happen. Yes. Uh, Corey Feldman's dog. Corey Feldman's dog. And uh, another thing I wanted to bring up um, before I forget, and maybe Jamie can show some footage of this, but there's this brilliant scene where Michael Caine goes back to the scene of the accident and he's walking through the field looking for looking his through, hand. looking for his hand he finds his ring but there's these incredible pov shots in the grass from the point of the of view of the hand yes following him around and it's shot so well I, but i mean it's schlocky but it's also it's badass man it's weird it's, it's good It's effective it, it, tension, but it also made me wonder. I'm like, can the can the hand see and hear or something? Like, I don't yeah, understand yeah. quite how it <laughs> gets around. Yeah. Oh, and you know what? We should mention at the beginning of this movie, there are credits that say that it's based on a short story called The Lizard's Tail. Because like, yes. if you cut off a lizard's tail, it will still like have some reflexes and jump around a little. I guess. Yeah. So that's sort of the idea that they're like, well, what if something was cut off and just kept going? Right, right. And so it's based on something. Yes. And after this scene, there's a, an amazing scene of Michael Caine, of Jonathan, getting his artificial hand. And it's a metallic robotic hand that I'm assuming they created just for this movie. This didn't, this technology didn't exist in the early 80s. No, but I there's think a it did, moment though, where I think it did, though. Because okay. all it is is like it's got like basically a, um, a metal cord attached to like, you know, the, the, the gripping mechanism that's also attached to his shoulder. And so like the further out you, 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 you pull it, that makes the hand tighten up. And I yes. think that that did exist. I now, think there's a real. moment, though, where he tests the power of it and he's like, it's powerful. And the doctor's like, yeah. And the first time I saw this movie, Chris, I was like, is this going to become like a RoboCop thing? Like, is he going to start? Yes. Is he going to start <laughs> messing no. people up with this robot hand? I know. What? I thought the same thing because the doctor's <laughs> like, yeah, it's powerful. And I'm like, oh, they're setting something up here. He never really uses that against anyone. Yeah. Yeah. So he's able to. And but there's there's by, an, that, by that point, they're, they're in New York, right? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so he's agreed to go with the wife to, to live in like a small apartment in New York. And my favorite scene, well, maybe my favorite scene, one of my favorite scenes, we briefly see Anne at that new age place called Origins and everybody's doing yoga, except every single person is doing completely different poses. And the instructor's just sort of wandering around going like, yes, like this. And I was like, what kind of a class is that? Just Everybody do whatever the hell you want. Yes. Do whatever free, pose you, you feels good to you. <laughs> it's like free form yoga. But when Michael Caine comes into the room and is in like that balcony off on the distance, he sees the instructor oh, touching his that. wife and correcting her pose. Yeah. And again, just the rage inside of him. You can see through those eyes of his and he hates all of this. He hates her he hates his he life. He hates the situation, yeah. He, now, he hates it all. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, and then to make matters worse, Chris, um, his editor brings in a younger cartoonist to start drawing. drawing the Mandro strip. The cartoonist is Charles Flesher. Charles the Fleischer. Voice of, the voice of Roger Rabbit. Yes, it is. Charles and, Fleischer, it, it, by the way, I just want to mention... I've always liked him. Um, I, I remember seeing him uh, uh, do stand up in, in LA, like a friend of mine opened for him back in like 99, maybe. And mm -hmm. I got to meet him. Uh, he's had an interesting career. Everybody knows him for the, as the voice of Roger Rabbit. That's his claim to fame. But around this time he was showing up in movies. He was famously the, uh, the, the main doctor in the first nightmare in Elm street. When like Nancy oh, comes right. out of the dream and she's brought like, you know, Freddie's hat, I want to say. He's that's the right. doctor in that scene. He's done a bunch of movies. He has um, yeah. a character actor. 
he's really young in this. He's really yes. young. He's the young upcoming guy that's got like new ideas for yes. Mandro. And this is incredible, man, because I've sort of been in these situations where Michael Caine says to him, oh, your work is different than mine. It's interesting. Charles takes that as a compliment. We all know that is that is a savage diss. He does not like the work. He does not like the new direction and interpretation no. of his sacred character. No, and, Mandra wouldn't do that. Yes. And, and you can just feel, again, just the tension of things are not, going John's way. Like things are just not working out for him and they're not going to work out, you no, know, like no, this, nothing gets better. Right. So it, did you it, notice um, though, Jim, did you notice that like the actual art pages are absolutely done by the same artist? Like both you, when John Lon Lonsdale draws it and when like uh, the, the new up and coming uh, artist draws it, it's, it's the same real life artist. Do you, you think so? Can you, can you go into that? Can you uh, extrapolate well, yeah. on that? So uh, I, I read up on this and they hired a real life artist and they hired the perfect artist, I think, for this. Uh, you only see his, his work fleetingly, uh, but it's Barry Windsor Smith, the great Barry Windsor Smith, who in 1981 was definitely uh, starting to make a big name for himself on Conan the Barbarian. Yep. And of course, Mandro is somewhat similar. And I guess um, Oliver Stone was uh, a fan of that comic. So they, they specifically went to Barry Windsor Smith. Uh, and they found that there were a lot of similarities between the character John Lons Lonsdale and Barry Windsor Smith, like in terms of their their height, their look. They're both British. They're both like drawing this like character. They, they found a lot of funny similarities. But Barry Windsor Smith has said that like, he felt his time in Hollywood was even more cutthroat. That was his word, uh, more cutthroat than his time at Marvel. And it actually drove him back to comics. He, he wow. didn't, he didn't apparently like love his experience in Hollywood. Yeah. That's a whole other road. My limited dealings with Hollywood too. It's like, uh, uh okay. I'd rather just be alone in the studio doing what I want to do, you know? Yeah. Uh, Less, um, less collaboration, right? I mean, comics, I mean, sometimes you'll you'll collaborate with a few people, but not like, you know, a movie obviously requires like dozens and dozens, dozens of people. So, uh, and, and, and the character of John Lonsdale is, is a very, how, how would I even describe it? He's a very solitary man and he's, he's got his vision for Mandro and no yes. one else should mess with it. Yes. Uh, one thing to mention too, um, Oliver Stone actually has a cameo in this movie. Yes, as he does. Also a one-handed homeless man, a vagrant that- Yeah, I didn't understand if there was supposed to be symbolism there. Sort of attacks John in one of the black and white- Barely. Scenarios. It's the blackout scenario. Um, and then after that, we see that John has given up on the Mandro comic and has taken a teaching gig in, in California. Well, you're skipping something over though, though, Jim, like- that the, the homeless guy gets killed, right? Oh, yes. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. The, yeah. That's a pretty big deal. In that, fact, he, he's probably the first person that the hand kills. That's the first kill. I'm sorry. Yeah, and, you're right. And what's funny about that to me is like, I, I instantly started thinking that meant that this hand went crawling from Vermont all the way down to New York City. Right, right. Because <laughs> I don't think it was hitchhiking or yes. hopping on a plane. It, it just, we saw it crawling in a field and then all of a sudden it's crawling through the garbage in New York City, just sort of spying on uh, on John. So the hand took a long, long walk. This is a resourceful hand, Chris. <laughs> this is, uh, and uh, <laughs> so, uh, so when John, John gets to this, I guess liberal arts kind of college and is teaching out in California now. Uh, yeah. He's yeah, teaching a, lot of a comic strip class and in another painful scene for him, Ugh. he's trying to get to know the class and he's like, let's talk, let's, give me your names. Let me know your favorite comic strip. None of the kids are really into comics. No, and, it was and, so awkward. It, it, yeah. it felt like something out of the office. He's like, you know, like the first kid, he's like, what's your favorite comic strip? And the kid's like, mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I was like, oh, and it's just like, just painful, awkward silence for a while as he yes. tries to like, see if like the kid will give a better answer. He asks another girl and she's like, mm. yeah, it's just, <laughs> oh man. So, I guess we're so, supposed to maybe not like the kids and also sort of have the idea that this is not a top tier school. Right. I think we're supposed to think that, that it's sort of like, you know, just a community college or something and not a great one. Yeah, because the accommodations they give him, the place he's staying in, is kind of a dump. Yeah, and, and he mentions that like to to several people. Um, he and then he starts having an affair with one of his students, a scandalous situation. He's so uh, like it makes him such a hypocrite, doesn't it? Because he's yeah. so mad that his wife might be interested in this guy. We don't know that she's like started an affair or anything. When he's furious with her, with her and yoga he, instructor, right, yeah. and then. John just starts sleeping with one of his students. Yes. And then he realizes that one of the other professors there, this guy, Brian, he's also having an affair with her. Her name's Stella. Well, he wants to. He wants to. Yes. He, okay. He's made okay. plans to go with her down to LA during like a spring break or something. Oh, yes. And, yes. and they're talking in the bar. He's like, oh, and, and this girl will do anything. Like, he's like, I can't wait to, to get her all to myself. Yes. And then he realizes John has already been with her. He realizes uh, that, yeah, like when she goes missing, I think. Yes. So getting towards the end of the movie, man, I don't know. I don't think we should maybe spoil the ending of this exactly, but I don't think it matters too much. It, it, it did come out in 81, but if you yeah. want to tell you what, if you want to like skip past the spoilers, I think our editor, Jamie can probably just put in a time code of when we're done talking about the, the, the finale. And, and then we can talk about it a little. Oh, sure. Sure. So, yeah. So, so here we have the time code, like let, let's get into the, the sort of denouement and the finale and everything. Yes. Uh, so, because eventually the the police do come to check on what, what they were they were checking on um why were they in his his garage actually the police come and they check on on John's garage his daughter freaks out when the mom gets assaulted that's right and they're staying with them and she goes to the cops that's right uh John has his one-on-one -on -one confrontation with the hand yes when he comes to the cops are in his garage and say open the trunk of your car. Because we smell called? something, which had been yeah. established. Like people were like, there's a smell in this garage. And we, yeah. we instantly know what that is, but like they, yes. they wait a while to, to reveal it. Yeah. And the reveal, the big reveal obviously is that Stella and uh, Brian are dead in his trunk. Jesus. Clearly strangled because they got crossed eyes, which yes. is disturbing, actually, in its yeah. own way. And basically cut to... So the very ending of this, the, the last scene of the movie, I felt was very, like, shot and looked like um, Terry Gilliam 80s style Oh, totally, because there's all like, that sort of weird sci-fi stuff, like, because like, he's seeing a psychologist, but he's got, like, you know, like, things on his temples to, like, monitor his electrocardiogram rhythms. I'm making up science terms. Yeah, right. That's okay. But there's lots so, yeah, of like stacks of computers and wires on the floor and stuff. It, it, it yeah. seems like more than you'd need. It looks like something out of Brazil. Gil yeah. Terry Gilliam's Brazil. And, and uh, you know, the doctor is sort of challenging him and figuring out like what is making him tick. And he's basically telling her the hand is, you know, the hand did it. The hand did it. The hand, and the hand is going to kill you as well. What does the hand want? It wants to kill you. And then, you know, kind of like cut to credits as he... Well, he, get, he escapes. He gets away with it. Yeah. If this movie was made today, people would demand a sequel because like the killer gets away with it and stuff, you know, he'd, yes. he'd, he'd become like a franchise killer or something like a jigsaw or something like that. Uh, but this was just a one and done. Uh, you know, I think it, I think it fulfilled everybody's goal at the time. Oliver Stone was still breaking in and he obviously proves that he can like create a, a scene with tension. 
He has a few shots that are um, innovative in terms of the cinematography. Uh, gets realistic performances out of everybody. I think the script may let the overall thing down just a little because, like I say, John starts as a jerk and he never really gets better. I, yeah. I, I think it might have been interesting if he started a little bit sweeter and halfway through or a third of the way through, he found out about the affair after he lost his hand and started to um, become more vindictive. Mm -hmm. uh, it, but I don't know how you then get the initial scene of uh, where he loses his hand. I, I don't know. Like that, that, that's that. I don't know how you solve that problem. Um but, but, you know, and Michael Caine said he just did it because he wanted like, um, to, to do a, a payment for building a garage, like a big, <laughs> right. a humongous garage to his house. So he, he like yeah. just, he got paid and that was his yeah. goal and he did it. Yes. And you know, it watching it, if you're in, if you're a creative person, if you're a, a, an artist, someone who uses their hands, you can understand and relate to his bad fortune. Absolutely. But at the same time, it's like you said, man, he already starts the movie as kind of a crabby Awful. asshole. Yeah. Um, Weird decision, uh, right? That he starts like that? Yeah. It's kind of like when people talk about what they don't like about The Shining, where Jack Nicholson art starts the movie and he kind of seems a little crazy already. I could, hmm, You know, yeah. like he's already kind of an oddball guy and then you know, I, but I still read that movie as as uh, he had the potential to 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 go mad, and he does. But he wasn't yes. quite. He wasn't overtly crazy and, until they get to like you know locked up in the uh, the hotel at, at winter. Yeah, there, there was still a little more of an arc. There was a little yes. more of an arc. Uh, I I feel like that's sort of what keeps this from being you know like really remembered. Uh, I think that this is like, you know, a fascinating movie and, and you're like, well, wait, I, I haven't heard of a movie by Oliver Stone starring Michael Caine. And you might not have, you might not have, it, it's, it's more of a cult hit and it's because it's, it's imperfect in that way, but it's not too bad. It's, it's long though. It is long. It's like about two hours or so. Yeah. And I, and it may have been, it may have been better at an hour and a half, but, but that's just me. They, they, much. they could have trimmed it up a little bit, you know, Maybe. but, um, I didn't enjoy the atmosphere of it. I did enjoy yeah. that Oliver Stone thought he was making something of a higher quality. And I there's think moments, so. There's moments that are just pure B movie schlock with, you know, the, the special effects and, and the way things unfold. But I, enjoy all that, obviously. Totally so, enjoy it. You know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Just, I do recommend it. Uh, I bought it on Amazon as a rental. Yeah. Do you know too. where you, you, you did the same? Yeah. Yeah. That's where so, I found it. I think it's, I mean, it's, Rebox. it's out there. Um, it's interesting cause I didn't know about this movie until like five years ago. And just the idea of like, wait, Michael Caine, comic book artist. I know. Uh, right. How, you have to give it a shot. It, it, it's bizarre that more people don't know, but you know, it's just kind of one of those early eighties things you have to look for, you know, there's a lot from the early eighties that has been sort of forgotten and it's our mission to excavate that stuff, yes. shine it up and show that they're not all gems, but like, uh, maybe we can give it a little polish. Yes. Shall I talk about the movie that, uh, that I, uh, asked you to watch? Let's go for it. You'd seen this before and so had I, but like, I think not for a while. I chose yeah. when we were talking about doing sort of a schlock movie thing, pieces. Uh, I love these weird co-productions in the seventies and eighties from like America and Canada, America and Spain, America and Italy, because they always come out a little weird. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's pieces from 1982, kind of the same time frame. So much worse because this is a oh, movie yeah. oh, about yeah. it's so straightforward on a Boston college campus. There is a killer using either chainsaws or knives to kill women. Uh, and the police are so drastically underfunded. They basically turn to a former women's tennis pro and one of the college students 
to help them resolve this crime. Uh, you can tell <laughs> that it's weird because right from the beginning, all of the audio, even though people are clearly speaking English, it's all dubbed. Yes. So it's one of those yeah. movies kind of like the old uh, Sergio Leone spaghetti westerns where they they filmed it, but they didn't record sound. And right. then they'd have like the actors like dub their lines later. Very strange way of doing things. Shh. When did you get this? I thought I told you a half hour ago. Because this was, this is supposed to take place in Boston and it was shot in South America. Oh, was it shot in South America? Yeah. I didn't look up where it was shot, but it yeah, definitely it was, wasn't Boston. I grew was, up in Boston. Yes. Nothing Boston about this. It was, um, <laughs> my notes say that it was shot in Madrid. So, uh, Oh, Madrid is Spain. Oh, Spain. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That yeah. makes more sense. Cause Spain yeah. was the co-producer. Okay. Spain. I'm um, sorry. that makes sense. It did drive me a little nuts that there was pretty much never an establishing shot of the college campus. Yeah. Like it, it, it's something that like, just sort of like in the back of your mind, it's very strange when a movie never really has an establishing shot. You just cut to the room with the characters in it and they're doing something. Yes. It, 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 it messes with you, but yeah. uh, he, I'll break this one down or I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, Please do. So, it starts in Boston, 1942, we're told. Just a regular house. And inside, a little kid is making a puzzle. Okay, fair enough. Mom comes in, sees what the puzzle is, starts beating the crap out of the kid. Because the puzzle is porn, right? Yes. Yes. A nude woman. A nude woman. Where did this filth come from? <clears throat> Like a centerfold out of Playboy or something. Right. It's pretty innocent, all things considered. What's funny is that it's only like 50 pieces. You can just tell it's like one of the simplest puzzles <laughs> like possible. It's really not complex, but whatever. Whatever. Right. The mom beats him and she she starts like tearing his room apart, looking to see if he has any more of this filth, right? Uh, I don't know if you, you you noticed this, Jim, but when she opens like his toy box and starts throwing stuff out, there were comic books in there. Yes, yes. There yes. were comics. 1942. Like, well, Think of how valuable those would have been. Those are some golden age classics in there. Probably had like action <laughs> comics, number one, that she just ruined. <laughs> so maybe she deserves what comes next. I don't right. know. The kid takes an ax to his mom. <laughs> Where did it's he wild. get that axe? Because he has it right away. It's wild. This is before the credits roll. We have yeah. a major murder. We have a kid murdering his mom. Like two uh, minutes in tops. Yeah. Two minutes to credits, in. which the credits in this are awesome. The, the lettering font with the dripping blood on the letters. Really cool. No animation, but just, yeah, drawn with like dripping yeah. blood and stuff like that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, real classy. I've got my notes here. I'm going to move in front of me so that I don't miss any of this uh, nonsense. Um, sure. What I liked is that, uh, so he kills the mom and you'd think the scene's over. Like we've established what we need to do. Uh, this is probably what makes it a bad movie is that the scene continues with like, I don't know, like a babysitter or something trying to get in and the cops come to, to check on because she heard screams and the kid is finishing the puzzle, which made me wonder, like, does this main character, does he have an obsession with girls or, or just puzzles? Mm, right. right. <laughs> because he does insist on finishing or both, it. Or I, both I, I guess. Yeah. Very. Yeah. It, also, we should mention that while there's a lot of killings in this and there's definitely lots of blood, we pretty much mostly only see the aftermath of most of these attacks. There's not a lot of, you know, high level gore effects right yeah is yeah. not who, who's the famous guy that did everything from like you know dawn of the dead to uh the friday the 13th uh first movie and oh, stuff. Uh, tom savini tom savini you know yeah. it, it doesn't have access to a tom savini yeah. there's a few little things that start to happen but mostly we just see the result the aftermath which is a lot yeah. easier to portray and that's what the case here what we do see in the kills, though, I think is w for this budget of a movie, I think it is well done. It is yeah. well edited. Yeah. And there's enough blood splurting through the air that you definitely get the idea of, of what's happening. Look, that's what uh, you come to this movie for, right? Like, yes. this is not high art. This is for no, just like is, getting to like, a, 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 you know, a cool kill. That's yeah. all it is. This and is glorious it, trash. It's, it's awesome. 
Um, <laughs> the cops that came in just walk through the, the, the whole bloody scene, by the way. But this was 1942. I don't know. Maybe they didn't understand. Yeah. Like protecting a crime scene, which they don't, by the way, in 1982 or whatever in the modern day. But we'll get there. Um, it, it cuts to, you know, uh, a close up of an adult's gloved hand remaking the puzzle and pulling out the crime scene evidence i'll be honest i'm like okay this writer has no idea how you know a a criminal investigation goes because how does the criminal as an adult like 40 years later have access to all of of this like evidence (laughs) yes that's not an important part of the story and Real quick, Chris, I do want to say that since this movie was made by this Spanish guy, his name's Juan Simone, uh, JP to his friends, <laughs> my research said that this dude hadn't visited America when he made this movie up to the point where he made this movie. So his version of an American campus is just what he saw through American television and movies. That makes so, so much sense. So this movie, like other classic movies like Troll 2, Samurai Cop, The Room. It's when a foreign director, and no disrespect to foreigners, relax everybody. It's when a foreign director tries to do what they think is American. Yeah. And by doing that, they just sort of miss the bullseye. Right. But you get this glorious, weird interpretation of American culture, including what you were talking about with like a crime investigation and how that happens. None it's of it all makes slightly sense. off. It's all weird. And when we yes. get to the college campus, the, the teenage, none of them talk like real people. They're, they're talking about how they want to smoke weed and have sex. On I have that quote. I have that quote. Let me get to it in two seconds, because what I was amused by is we're in the modern day now. And we see a girl skateboarding. Obviously, she's not actually doing it because none of the shots show like somebody actually skateboarding. It's all just like her, you know, like head up, just sort of like with the background going like, whoa, because this is what skateboarders do. Hi. Hello. (laughs) And we establish that there's some guys uh, carrying a huge window pane of glass. She crashes into it. And none of that is ever referred to again. I have no idea what that had to do with the movie. Okay. Here's something I found and I want to run this past you. Please. In the beginning scene when the mom loses her shit over the puzzle. Yes. And smashes the mirror. Oh, okay. Yeah. The glass shatters. Yeah. There's a theory that that's what incites the kid to murder her. Oh. Cut cut to the college campus 40 years ago. Uh Uh-huh. A girl crashes into glass and dies. The, The glass crashing incites, spoiler, the dean who's on campus to start murdering again. That's... I guess that makes sense, but talk about somebody coming up with like a Marvel no prize to explain something that the movie doesn't even hint at. Yes. That well, makes Chris, sense, it's, but it's none of that is addressed. It's, pre- it's preposterous. That's so but weird. Oh, I, I did some digging sense. and I found this theory of like, okay, so wait, the Dean, he was on campus and he heard the window pane crash right. or he, he found out about, or he, he witnessed it from across campus or... It wasn't you never heard glass he break over 40 years? He never heard <laughs> glass break? He ne- yeah. like It's not like I hear it every day, but people hear glass break. <laughs> yes. So, and just to let everyone know who hasn't seen this movie, there's so many things in this movie that do not make sense that no. while you're watching this with friends, you're, you're, you're all going to be saying like, wait, why is this happening now? What is this? Oh what? my God, yes. So, so just go into it knowing... They didn't, you know, plug up all the holes in in this thing. So I didn't think they even tried, to be honest. It's very strange. The as soon as we get past that girl skating into the glass, we cut to a girl on the campus quad, just like, you know, like um, laying down on on a blanket and reading and stuff. And a guy with a chainsaw just like walks out of the bushes and, and, and kills her. 
Yes. It just it just happens. There's no tension built for that one at all. It's a glorious beheading. Jamie, can we get a little clip of that, please? Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> just in broad daylight. Yes. In broad yes. daylight. Uh, and a chainsaw is not a quiet machine, but I guess he gets away with it. Yeah. And 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 then right after that, I think when they established the first red herring of who the killer could be, and mm. it's the actor who plays Bluto from the Popeye movie. He's introduced pretty shortly after that. Yes. Willard is the character's name. Yeah. Uh, Correct. Played by the same actor that played Bluto in Popeye like the year or two before Robert Altman's Popeye. Yes. He has such an awesome look. I think Paul Smith was the actor's name. Great look. Okay. But he always sort of like every scene he's in, he just sort of looks angry and he's like looking like this. He squints yes. one eye and opens the other and he's just like, he looks like he's ready to punch anyone that talks to him. Yeah. But, but Chris, there's scenes of him where he's outside and he's like cleaning a chainsaw. Yes. You, you know what I mean? He, he, the he first time we see him, he's like stroking the chainsaw <laughs> with like a rag. Like, and, and it's like, it was such a red herring that I was like, well, he's clearly not the killer. It's just way too obvious. But like, we're meant to suspect him. Um, this girl's been killed and we cut to like the Dean's office. That's an important character. We meet two other important characters. Lieutenant Bracken, Sergeant Holden, the two police that I guess are assigned to investigate this, they do literally like nothing through this whole movie, but they, they are always there to clean up the crime scene and go like, we got to stop this. Yeah. Like, put people like, uh, do a curfew, do the bare minimum. I don't know. Yes. Um, they're talking to the Dean's secretary. We, and, and we cut to another important character uh, and have this quote that you liked. We cut to um, Professor Brown is the uh, college's anatomy professor. A little bit of suspicion on him because he's kind of quiet. He's the anatomy professor. Maybe he's got an obsession with body parts. Uh, and some of the students are sort of like joking and teasing. And this one girl goes, uh, uh, and, and Jamie, maybe you can just cut it in. But here's her quote. The most beautiful thing in the world is smoking pot and fucking on a waterbed at the same time. Sure. Hey. hey That's how it, kids talk. <laughs> <laughs> and then she sort of, um, she, she tries to make the professor uncomfortable by like going up to him and going like, are my breasts normal? And yeah. he's like, yes, they are. They, 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 they're here. Yes. They're, they're normal. Yes. It's completely out of left field and very bizarre, but. And it makes you just sort of you know. go like, okay, Professor Brown seems off. He seems weird. They sort of explain that right at the very end, why he's a little different, I guess, uh, yeah. in how he reacts to this girl. We cut from this to the secretary saying that she heard that the lieutenant thinks it's an inside job. And I have to admit that while it is, that strikes me as like the writer knew where this was going and like planted that. But there's really nothing that ever, like to me, seems evidence that it's an inside job, that it's a faculty right. member as compared to a student or, you know, just somebody that like a janitor that has access. I don't know. They're right. like, it's an inside job. It's got to be one of the faculty. That's who we're all supposed to think. Ridiculous. There's um, no setup for that. No. No. And maybe I'm lingering too much on this. Um, the Dean makes Professor Brown uh, serve as a tour guide for the cops, right? And this is another weird scene that doesn't make sense. And the, the professor's like, I'm busy. And, and the Dean's like, well, not as busy as I am. <laughs> He's like, okay, fair. <laughs> the, the professor like goes to his anatomy room and they go like, hey, uh, do you know this girl? Like, did she run around with guys? And he's like, I didn't really know her that well, to be honest. And they're like, okay, well, we're done. We're going to go read the coroner's report. I was like, so they didn't really need a tour. Yeah. I don't know what any of that was. It's just like such, so much of this movie could really be condensed and cut down. It's an hour and a half, maybe, maybe an hour 25, but it could probably be cut down to like 70 minutes tops. Yes. 
It, yeah, because man, I just rewatched this and you're right about that scene because there are so many scenes put in this movie as padding to make it an hour and a half. Yes. Um, not to jump ahead, but there's like a, a scene with two women playing tennis. Yes. And, and it goes it just, on for too it, long. It, it, it just goes on with these women playing tennis. One of them is an established, becomes an established character in the movie, but it's like, and now here's the big riveting tennis scene well in the in that uh, scene that like one of them is supposed to be a tennis pro but it's clear that the actors don't know tennis because they're just yeah. sort of like lobbing the ball way up high it's 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 the most boring flat uninteresting tennis scene you've ever seen yes and it goes on for a while yeah um so yeah that's basically after the the secretary the cops and the dean and professor that's when we first meet willard stroking his chainsaw great character um, but this is probably the, the beginning of my favorite sequence in the whole movie. The, the, the girl that gets killed in the pool. Yes. We start in the library and the campus stud is a guy named Kendall. Dorkiest looking motherfucker ever. He's like, I don't know how, why they present him as a, as a stud. I, I completely agree with you. This guy is, is having Nothing. sex with all the hottest ladies on campus. Yes. How is this possible? I, uh, I don't know. And, and and a girl, it just like, no setup. They're just both studying. A girl just sends him a note that says like, I want to have sex in the pool. And he's like, cool. Yeah. She leaves, <laughs> strips, gets in the pool. Kendall, nowhere to be seen. Right. He just forgets to go, basically. <laughs> this is a main character, by the very way. Very slow, Chris. He's 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 showing up, but he's very slow. Also, when she goes into the, the pool room, this incredible uh, sexy saxophone music starts. The porno music. It's amazing. It's awesome. It's, it's hilarious. <laughs> it's awesome. Th this this movie has like sort of two types of music. When there's something sexy, they play like a real sort of sleazy, simple, like only one or two instruments, you know, like like you say, like a saxophone or something. Or when somebody's being like sort of chased or stalked, you know, it's just a sort of da dun da dun like very like there's just two types of music, very simple music. Yeah. The yes. girls in the pool. And the killer arrives. This is the first time we've really seen the killer stalk someone because the girl in the quad, he just kills. He's all in black, right? He's got black boots, gloves, hat. We never see his face. Mm -hmm. And how does he get the girl out of the pool, Jim? With a uh, pool leaf rake skimmer, the skimmer. tool. Yeah. And Chris, the pool is indoors. Yeah. The nice, nice indoors. college, nice college, an indoor so how, pool. Why do you need the pool skimmer? To uh, there's I, no I, leaves. I I think it would be very annoying to have like a small net put over your head, but I don't think if you were swimming, it would be that hard to go underwater or to push yes. it off. I just don't think it would be that hard. Yes, but this she, could. It drags this completely, her. It completely discombobulates her and um, like almost knocks her out for some reason. Yeah, because he just yeah. like then like lifts her up gently out of the pool, topless. Didn't mind that. Yes, <laughs> it's the kind of movie it is. She's <laughs> right next to the edge of the pool, and he just starts up a chainsaw and walks over, and she just stays there and takes it. Yeah. That's what makes this yes. schlock to me is that like they, they never think about how to trap someone. It's, the girls just basically at, at a certain point, just stop. Yeah. And, 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 and just take the abuse. It's, it's awful. It's, it's a very misogynist movie. I will say it is. Yes. But you're, but you're right. It's like, there's these moments as the viewer where you're like, I mean, I guess you could say this with every slasher movie where you're like, you can run away. You can, a good slasher can, movie has somebody scream and run. In a good way. Like yeah. what? Yeah. 
what is happening? Uh, okay. Well, it has to happen because of the, mo- it has to happen for the movie. Right. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it's happening in the reality of the movie. And like, why, it's like you said, why does Kendall not show up to hook up with this hot blonde? He's, he just never does. Primping his hair or something. I, I, I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> who knows? He was just invited. And instead of following her, he's just like, yeah. he, like he doesn't say it, but it's sort of like, yeah, maybe I'll see you in half an hour or something. Yeah. Um, the girl's killed and Kendall's nerdy friend who's called goggles, I believe, cause he's got glasses. Mm. Glasses equals nerd. Chris. We're a hey, goggles. <laughs> um, this is the goggles podcast, trash goggle podcast guys. He goes up to, to, to Kendall. This, this piece of the movie confused me and I've seen it twice recently and I still don't 100% understand what the note said or what the goal of it was, but he g- goggles gives Kendall a note that t- and he says, don't tell me I'm the bearer of bad news. I could kill myself. And it sends him like to the Dean's office, but it's also like goggles was, was slow in giving him that note. They say, I, I don't know. It was, it was somehow probably supposed to distract Kendall from following the girl, but I don't understand how the killer knew that that was happening. Cause it was like a secret note that just said like, you know, come see me in the, in the pool. Am, yes. Am I just, stupid honest, or does dude, it, I also, I also don't, it didn't make know. sense. Right. Yeah. Okay. I'm but just making sure that I'm not. An idiot. <laughs> but there's, it's funny that when you watch a movie like this, you have to check in with someone else who's seen it and be like, okay, did I miss no, something or was didn't. I looking at my phone or, and, and it's like, no, we're on the same page. There's a lot of this that doesn't make sense. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, um, who else gets killed? Let me think. Um, oh, oh, but well, Chris, Ken, well, go ahead. With the girl who gets murdered in the pool though. Yes. Do you want to talk about when the cops show up? Yes, I with, do. Okay. Yes, I do. That's um, an incredible scene. Cause right before that, both Kendall and Willard are, are like, are in that room. They turn on the light. They surprise each other and the cops fight and arrest Willard. That's done. Now it's time for, to, to, to investigate the crime scene. And I forget what you call the sort of like morgue attendants or, or, or people, but they're, they, they've got the girl's body parts all bagged by the pool. In it, like a stack. It's crazy. In a stack. It's gross. <laughs> it's like a stack of like freezer meat, which maybe it was intentional. That maybe I'm not giving it enough credit. Bracken is there. Lieutenant Bracken and he has Professor uh, Brown come in, the, the, the anatomy professor. And he goes, he's always got a, a like a sort of a cigar, cigarillo type thing. And he's like, Professor, I don't want to wait for like, you know, the, uh, the pathologist. Can you tell me, could that chainsaw have been used as the murder weapon? And right next to this stack of bloody body is that chainsaw all bloody. And the cops are like, could that have been the murder weapon? <laughs> I don't want to wait for the pathologist. I need it. You, you know, anatomy, like, could it have been professor Hol- Brown goes and like sort of touches the, the chainsaw to look at it. And he goes, as soon as he does like bracket goes, wait, no, don't touch that. Oh, you could have ruined some evidence. Right. I'm like, you just told the guy to go over and look at it. This all happens in like a second. And then Brown has probably, the best quote in the movie where he just goes, I'm not a pathologist, but even a layman could see this could have been the murder weapon. And then like the police just go, okay, thanks. It is the most ludicrous thing that happens in the movie. You're my brain almost exploded the first time I saw the movie where I was like, the cops don't know for sure whether the bloody chainsaw is what made the girl be chopped up into pieces. It's right there. What? Uh, it's right there. <laughs> it's covered in blood. <laughs> it's covered in blood. There's body pieces everywhere. Could this have been? They don't even like ask like, you know, was it for sure? They're just like, could it have been? And, and like, uh, yeah, Brown like picks up a, a hand and like sort of looks at like the chop marks for like a second and then like looks at the chainsaw and he's like, I'm not a pathologist, but uh, it is possible. <laughs> It's, it's like, insane, dude. That's it, one of the examples where like, I think you're right that they were padding the time because it does mm-hmm. not, 
it doesn't make anybody else a suspect or anything. It's like maybe we needed to see some of the aftermath of this particular kill, but the the dialogue is just insane. It it and and that that scene, both that kill and and, and the the follow up was what made me really like this movie and want to watch it for on this. Yeah, because because that is the craziest part I think. Don't touch it, professor. You could have destroyed some evidence. Well, I'm not a pathologist, but uh, even a layman could see it was done with this. I'd say it's elementary. Okay, thanks. This is Hard this is a trash game. movie classic, man. This so is this trashy is in the Hall of Fame. Um, did you? So I I wanted to bring up that this dude Kendall basically becomes the protagonist of the movie, where yes. he's almost like deputized by the police department in, in, in so many words, they, they, they essentially like every once in a while they go, we really shouldn't be doing this, but tell you what, (laughs) you know, and and they, they have him, they have him do everything that they're supposed to do. They have him do everything. They just assign him. Bracken just keeps giving him work to do. Yes. And he's excited. He's like interested. He's like, all right, sure. A teenage boy is now involved in these brutal murder cases, teaming up with, Linda Day, who plays the pro tennis, tennis player, player slash undercover detective. Right. <laughs> what? The it, cops. Chris, I, have to the ask, cops I have to ask you, yeah. how can you be an undercover cop, but also be a well-known tennis pro, player, pro tennis player? It's like, it's like they didn't even think about that because there's, there's no, the only reason for her to like know tennis is because they basically have her go undercover as a tennis instructor at the college. But it's like she's not supposed to be the famous tennis pro that Kendall recognizes her to be. It would call so much attention to this investigation. Yeah. She is technically supposed to sort of be the lead, even though Kendall gets all the work. Yes, I, and and God God knows what Bracken and Holden are doing this whole time. Lieutenant Bracken and Sergeant Holden, they're just they're just they just show up at the crime scenes, right? And they're just like, "Did you learn anything?" Oh my God, dude! <laughs> and then they so they they <laughs> they tell. By the way, the cops first tell the dean that this is what they're doing. Okay, so he knows the plan. They're like, "We're putting an undercover person in here," and the dean is like, "Is that really necessary?" And it's like, whether you're the killer or not, yeah, there have been two murders on your campus. Like, is it necessary? Yeah, dude, there's, yeah. it's two murders. It's necessary. Um, I, just bizarre. Um, there's, I have a there's big, go ahead. I have a big question to ask you, Chris. I mean, this is a very, very important question. What the hell is Bruce Le doing in this movie? Yeah. Out of nowhere, yeah. there's a kung fu scene with Bruce Le, who is one of the Bruce Lee exploitation actors after Bruce Lee. I think died, his name Bruce- was actually pronounced also Bruce Lee, even though it's L E. But but yeah, okay. I know what you I know who you're talking about. Well, I, I watched uh this is very nerdy, but when Joe Bob Briggs was talking about this movie, he was oh. pronouncing it L- Le. Well, was he? Because well he would know Bruce, better than me then. He would know was better Bruce than Bruce Lie. There Bruce was. Lee was obviously the real guy, and then there was all these different Bruce. Bruce Lee guys imitators. who were exploiting Bruce Lee after he died, making these, you know, fake Bruce Lee Kung Fu movies. But regardless, this dude shows up and um, Linda Day is on campus at night doing some Scooby-Doo investigating. Well, she's and, really just walking down the street, but yeah, or, or like the campus. But he just attacks her with some Kung Fu moves. She kicks him in the groin and takes him out. Kendall shows up and is like, oh, hey, what's up? That's my Kung Fu instructor. <laughs> Better, better. He calls him his Kung Fu professor. Yes. It would make sense if he was his Kung Fu instructor, but he calls him a professor. Now a professor is like, you have to earn that rank. So like, does he actually teach Kung Fu at the school and he's a professor of Kung Fu? But you're right. It makes no sense. It's, it's just there to give you sort of a jump scare. Cause like a guy jumps out of the bushes and attacks her name is Mary Riggs, played by actress um, Linda Day. Oh, mm-hmm. by the way, let's pause real quick. Linda Day in real life was married to the guy that plays Lieutenant Bracken. 
I'm pretty sure that this couple literally took this job for a Spanish vacation. Yes. Right? I mean, like, what other reason would they both have to be in this? Yeah. It, it I, It's not really the kind of movie that they would do otherwise. In my I think opinion. you're 100% right. Um, there are other weird scenes like, uh, uh, Kendall gets introduced by the police to a psychologist and, it, uh, he goes like, what they want to do is create a psychological profile. There's like this awkward beat. <laughs> and then they just cut away from that. We don't get to like, I don't know why Kendall would know anything about the yeah. killer to create a psychological profile. Again, just scene after scene. Uh, stuff in this movie there's a scene of like a killer stalking a dance instructor but then the jump scare yeah. is just she bumps into a friend um yeah. well again man it's almost like okay what does juan simone think of american culture it's i don't know throw in some kung fu stuff throw in aerobics because that's early 80s throw in pot smoking water beds the water bed um, is, is um, one of the better kills whatever uh, American tropes that he thinks he can throw into his slasher movie, but it creates this great series of non sequiturs though, that oh, make yeah. the movie so fun, especially if you're hanging out, drinking cheap beer with your friends, watching this on a Friday night. That's the experience of, of pieces is the, the, the fact that it doesn't make sense makes no. it glorious. No. And all of the kills are so similar, you know, like the, the, they, they, it's just a woman that gets like sort of chased by the, the killer. You, you, you never see like his full body or anything. And then they just sort of stop at a certain point. Like the girl that just stops on the waterbed in a sauna. And I don't know why there'd be a waterbed in the gym. There's the girl who gets trapped on the elevator. Um, there's the girl who um, gets trapped in a bathroom stall. And almost right. all of them get topless, I will say. So it's yes. that's what I mean when I say it's sort of misogynist. It's it's yeah. very like none of these women have much agency. The closest you get is Mary Riggs, the tennis instructor, and she's useless. Um, Can we talk about her um, legendary bastard scene? Oh yes, I have that. I have that. So we because Jamie has to show this this is this is an oscar worthy moment yes for her. This, is, this is unbelievable oh, where, where where is my note here but you're right okay so <laughs> one of the girls that gets chased through like sort of the locker room and she ends up hiding in a bathroom stall which of course the chainsaw cuts through um but even though kendall and mary riggs happen to be basically right outside that area is a total coincidence considering how big the campus is there's this annoying music being blasted over this school intercom system just this sort of marching band music that's clearly like you know royalty free and it's really annoying they eventually sort of get willard to he's been let go from because he clearly isn't the killer he he uh right. he gets he, he's been released he opens the control room they shut off the music while mary and willard were doing that Kendall just sort of went off on his own. Really good idea when there's a killer out there. And he finds the body. And Mary loses it. This is her big emotional scene. I'm sure Linda Day thought that she was doing well. Just sort of screams bastard like three times. Maybe yes. editor Jamie, you can like let the folks see what that, what that brilliance is. Uh, it's so strange. You see it? Yes! While we were out here fumbling with that music, the lousy bastard was in there killing her! Bastard! Bastard! It speaks for itself. It's an unbelievable scene where, again, your brain is just like, what? What's happening now? What? <laughs> it is annoying music. Um, it, 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 I understand that. Like, by the way, at this point, you have to realize the heroes have never even come close to saving any of these victims. Right. Every single time there's one of these co-eds in danger, nobody really even comes close. With one tiny exception, there's the girl that gets on an elevator at night and the killer gets in the elevator with her. She recognizes him and lets him in doesn't realize that he's carrying a massive chainsaw with him. Chris, it's behind his back. It's, yeah, well, it's, yeah, you know, it, 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 a, a humongous chainsaw behind the back. Like, 
We've all done that. Surprise, chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> that could have been one of the scenes where he uses his knife because there's like two scenes where he kills with a knife instead of a chainsaw. Yeah. That yeah. would have made more sense, but whatever. Best thing about that. So like she screams, Kendall's nearby. It's at night. He and the cops do try to like break into the school. They're having trouble with locked doors. They get there. They find the girl. And then every character in the movie is there for that crime scene because the police are there. The secretary, the dean, Willard, uh, Kendall, Mary. Uh, a Professor Brown, they're all there. So it's sort of like, oh, everybody was nearby. It could have still been any of them, right? Uh, and at first they go like, uh, the girl lost an arm. She, she's barely alive. Like, you know, we're going to try to get her to the hospital. Same scene. I don't think there's even a cut. The psychiatrist guy walks up and he goes, she had dead nerve endings and lost a lot of blood. She's as good as dead. I was yes. like, what? What did yeah. I just miss there? They go like, Oh, got her just in time. She's as good as dead. No. She's alive and now she's dead. We're just told no. both, like right in a row. This yeah. movie jerks you around. Um, this movie's a goddamn roller coaster ride, Chris. Oh, it's, what a it's, roller coaster. Uh, the, the, the thrills and chills of I'm probably pieces. over explaining everything, but what's kind of funny is that um, at this point, after this, this kill, like what are we up to? Like five or six dead people. Uh, all of a sudden, Bracken tells Holden, like, we've got to start reviewing the, the profiles of all the staff. Yes. Yeah. I'm like, you weren't already doing that? Yeah. He and, just and, decides to do that. Yeah. And, and he, Sergeant Bra Sergeant Holden's like, oh, we don't have enough manpower or something. He's like, okay, get Kendall to help you. While Kendall goes to help review files at the police headquarters, Mary goes to talk to the dean at night at his private residence. And this is when basically we have the reveal, which is like, there's still a bit of time left in the movie, but we flat out see the Dean drugging Mary's coffee, mm -hmm. gives it to her, talks, drugs it again, mm -hmm. <laughs> drugs it twice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> again, they want to, they want to use time. I, I was like, wait, is he really? And he goes through the whole process of like, you know, like making coffee, opening the cupboard, like pulling out this gripper. <laughs> and I was like, you just did this. Like, Dude, I'm so glad you brought this up because that you're so right. That was a padding moment where it's like the elaborate coffee making scene. She drinks the coffee and he's like, how about another cup? And then we watch him make another cup of coffee. <laughs> it shows it all. It doesn't cut or anything. <laughs> it's so padded. Of course, that paralyzes her. This is like kind of the only real tension in the movie, this scene, because we know Mary's in danger. And we know Kendall could be close to figuring it out because he's going through the files, but he's not there. Um, he He's like, oh, this guy changed his name. Kendall figures it out, not the police. The, Kendall figures it out. So the ki po police go and rush and uh, and they see Mary like uh, paralyzed on the bed when they get there, but don't see the Dean because he's hiding behind the curtains. <laughs> like the worst yeah. hiding place possible, but it fools yeah. them all. Hey, I guess it worked for a minute. I, I, I until he decided to attack Kendall, but because the police just for no reason just sort of walked away. Yeah, they were just yeah. like, "Well, it we're going to go do like, something." <laughs> and for the first time you see this, it's like, "Oh shit, Kendall, the dean is definitely going to kill Kendall." I thought you know? so. I didn't think he was like, even though we've been viewing him as sort of a viewpoint character. I was like, "Well, he he's got to die, right? He has like yeah. next to no trouble fighting the dean." Cops show up, take Shoot out him in the, the head. And okay, so it's over, right? Save the day. So, Chris, we have to address that the ending the of final, this movie, the final scare, is I think one of the greatest endings of any movie. I'm not exaggerating. The first time I, I don't know about you, but the first time I yeah. saw this movie, the very last shot, the very last thing that happens in the movie, I like jumped off the couch and was like, it, what you know what it reminded me of because of both the twist and how it's filmed is sleepaway camp if you've ever seen yes. the end of like yes. sleepaway camp yeah real low budget horror but also very weird yeah oh and something else this has in common i just realized even though we've talked about a lot of male nudity we do we see kendall's junk too we in do. one scene, don't we? that was that, right. that's also sort of like you're like oh this isn't a purely american movie because they just don't do that in 
you know, like Friday yes. the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street at the same time. You, you, you wouldn't see that. After he sleeps with yet another hot babe. Right. The reporter woman. No, not the reporter. Um, the reporter Our, is the, the lady that got killed, I think, in, in like um, maybe the elevator or something like that. She was because she was following Mary. He just okay. slept with a hot co-ed, got up, looked out the window, saw Mary was walking down the street and decided to get dressed and help her. And, and that's when we see he's naked. And the girl, again, this is where I think it's misogynist. She's just like, did I moan too much? You can gag me. Oh, shit. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, ooh. Okay. Um, she's kinky. Yeah, she's kinky. But yeah, so like we, we basically get like sort of t a devil scare in a row. First, for, for, for no real reason, a cabinet opens and a corpse falls on top of Kendall. The corpse being like you want to describe what it was. The corpse is the Dean's sick and twisted creation, which is a woman made up of all the body parts he's been collecting from different women. Mm. Jigsaw has puzzle s uh, sewn together. Yeah. Uh, pretty messed up. Pretty wild. Pretty, pretty wild. wild. Falls on top of him. They put it in slow-mo. Got it. It's disturbing. He gets up. They're all ready to leave. And the most bonkers thing in the world happens. Just, just so bonkers. Does not fit with anything else we've been told about this movie this is the reason for watching the movie people yeah skip skip to the very end if you don't want to have this final like scene spoiled jamie will put the time code there when we're done talking about this the corpse's arm she, she's alive somehow it grabs kendall's dick and basically like rips it off or, or castrates him somehow it yes. just claws it, in and like there's a big pop. Yes. It, her hand and fingers drag down his groin Gouge. and his testicles explode in her hand. Yeah. In a bloody explosion. And he crosses and he, his eyes. And he screams. And then cut to credits. Rude over it, kid. Let's go. Hey, my jacket. <laughs> So weird. Holy shit. Like w purely wow. just to give us a last scare, which I get, but they probably could have played up the body horror of the corpse falling on top of him for that final scare. The idea of like the, the hand is, is still alive or something. I'm like, where did any of that come from? So I wanted to ask you this, Chris. Um, so in the very last one minute of the movie, are we meant to believe that? So is there a supernatural element now where this corpse Frankenstein woman creation, she's also alive or she animates or was she always alive or she's supernatural? Like what? If so, there's <laughs> nothing else in the movie that even lightly hints at the supernatural, not even lightly. Right. Is, is this in somebody's mind or imagination? Like, no, it seems to be completely literal. I think it was purely just, this was a producer going, we need to end the movie on one one more scare. Yeah. And, and this was the bizarre idea they had. Uh, it makes no sense. It makes no sense. Yeah. Well, also, <laughs> you know, him looking at American movies, I think, you know, maybe they saw the very first Friday the 13th. I was just thinking Jason, of the exact same thing. Jason jumps out of the lake. And, and that's a very, that was a very shocking moment at the time. Um, Even and then, like, that was sort of like set up as, 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 as like, okay, because Friday the 13th had I think only come out the year before or something of when they made this. So they would have seen that. And, it, and, and the first movie is not supernatural. There's a killer, but they say that like the killer is Jason Voorhees' mom because Jason drowned in a lake and the camp counselors didn't save him. Spoiler for that movie that everybody already knows. And at the <laughs> end, like this sort of rotting child, Jason Voorhees, jumps out of the lake and pulls the lady back, back into the water. But that had enough ambiguity that you could think that it was either the character sort of like having a nightmare about something she'd been told about the history, mm -hmm. or it implies that there's more to the story still to come. One or the other. But this, I I don't know. Do you think that they really th 
thought they might get pieces too and it would be supernatural like and retroactively make that make sense uh, you know because so many movies were getting sequels during this era maybe they were hopeful maybe. um i don't know you know uh, it's funny man in, in my research i found out that this guy juan simone was like a, a really charming guy and celebrated in madrid because he was one of the few foreign filmmakers who actually got like american investment money mm. Like people liked him and I guess maybe he thought if this would be the next smash hit, the next Halloween, the next Friday the 13th. Yeah. There would be a sequel. There'd be uh, yeah, whatever, maybe. but um, if so, that's way overly ambitious. But for me, man, I, I, I do have to say, I mean, this is in the hall of fame for like what the fuck endings. It's, it's so weird. unbelievable. It's awesome. The and, end of the hand made sense and you could have made a sequel. Yes. This just like has something that we're like, let's just throw something completely new at the wall and see what sticks. Uh, yeah. No, I'd say it slid down that wall. It did not stick. It was right, very right. strange. Right. Very strange. I, I liked your rationale for how we decided on the order of this, Jim, like to talk about tonight. You want to explain oh, like what you oh, envision yeah. people doing? Thanks for reminding me. I forgot to say this in the very beginning of the show, but with this uh, lineup of movies, we have these two flicks if you're going to do this as a double p feature with friends, um, you know, I would say start off with the hand, invite your classier friends over, have hors d'oeuvres, maybe drink some wine or whatever, have some, a few laughs. And then pieces is after the hand, obviously. And that's when you invite over your beer chugging, <laughs> bong hitting friends. And you guys are hooting and hollering and laughing your ass off and enjoying the ludicrous beautiful insanity of pieces. And Chris, I'm so glad that you suggested pieces. It does let me know that you're maybe a more demented pervert than I am. Um, <laughs> right. I yeah, am kidding. I'm kidding, buddy. I'm kidding. Um, but it's such think, a weird movie that it just, like, it legit yes. just makes me laugh. Yeah. You, until you actually watch in context, that scene by the poolside with the police and professor Brown you just that 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 says it all. That says it all of what this movie is. Yes. Um, oh, and by the way, the the whole twist why Professor Brown acted weird is the dean says uh, he's a homosexual, so that's why he wasn't into girls. Oh, that's right. That's right. It's such yeah. a. It's such a like I don't know. I, it was 1982, so I guess that was like considered sort of more taboo or less spoken about or something. Because th that's what makes that 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 guy seemed like a little less, a little more quiet. He keeps to himself yes. for, and I was like, you know what? That sort of makes at least sense. Like why he keeps a little bit more to himself and why the girls are trying to make him feel awkward and stuff like that. I was like, okay, right. I sort of get that. By the oh. way, that guy was in a um, comic book type of a movie that same year. He was a priest in a, the Conan movie. Ah, nice. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, the last thing, I wanted to ask you uh, was the first time I watched pieces, I, I, I was a little disappointed because I felt like it's obvious that it's the Dean. It is. From the get go. It's pretty obvious. Do, they don't do, do, do it. Mean, job. Like yeah. it, it, I agree. It, so you, you, you know, red herrings, their attempt at red herrings is charming. It doesn't work, but that's, that's one of the, you know, bizarre things about the flicks. It's kind of like, well, yeah. it's obviously this guy. Yeah. So the only one I slightly suspected aside could have been professor Brown just because he's pretty quiet and in the background, but they do introduce him early on. So I was like, well, maybe, but, um, I pretty much suspected the Dean from the beginning. He was just like, I don't know. It, it, yeah. It's when there's these mystery type slasher movies, you really have to do a good job giving a potential motivation to a killer to make us actually suspect them, not just say that they're around. You know what I mean? And, right. and hardly any of them, even the Dean doesn't really, we don't really ever learn his motivation. He just has the, the sort of means to do everything. Yes. But there's no real motivation other than, like you said, like some forum was like, well, maybe the smashing glass set him off. I'm like, I guess. Chris, it's the it's the smashing glass theory. Do you not know this this theory? <laughs> God the, forbid the Michael Caine ever heard uh, smashing glass. His hand would go nuts. Have killed like three times as many people. Right, right. What, a, man, what a duo. 
What did you? I, I had a blast you? talking schlock movies with you, buddy. Um, I hope Chris and I, like we 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 do want to say a huge thank you to our editor and producer, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. Um, Jamie, along with my buddy Andrew Soria, made our opening animation, uh, which fun. is fantastic. I did some drawings for it, obviously, whatever. But at Jamie Wood Edits, if you are looking for an editor for a future project. Um, also, thank you to Sean Crystal for introducing me oh, to okay. Jamie. Uh, as and, long as we're we're doing that, do you have any plugs? I, I'll plug my website, just jimmafood dot com, to buy uh, books, prints, and fun stuff. And you can find me online at jimmafood social media. You guys know where I'm at. Perfect, um, Chris. And, and what can you plug? Look, you're you're already on one of my channels. Um, so if you guys can hit like and subscribe, that'll let us know that you want to see more of this because we'd be happy to. We've got a bunch of movies we've sort of uh, uh, brainstormed that we could talk about. I think that this is just fun for us. So we're willing to do it if you guys are uh, open to it. Uh, and I also have my channel Comic Tropes where I do more uh, edited analysis videos about either comic book techniques or history. Fantastic, buddy. Oh, and uh, leave your comments below on what schlock b movies you you're want to interested see. in yeah. and what you love and if it has anything that like ties into a cartoonist or an illustrator or something like that that like you know like what evil tunes was one you were watching recently which is technically <sighs> like you know a a, a schlocky one about a, an illustrator for for example like there's things like that out there there's so much we can cover buddy there's the there's ambulance that. with um uh, Eric Roberts as a Marvel Comics employee hunting down uh, organ snatchers. There's there's all yeah. sorts of ones that are tangentially related to comics that we could throw in with other yeah. schlocky nonsense. So that sounds like a great formula to me, man. Yeah, a little schlock, a little comic books, or, or something yeah. like that. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much for watching. Let's uh, let's go with the outro credits. Trash movie bonanza. Like and subscribe.